Vigyan Bhavan here in New Delhi. We just saw the arrival of the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi to inaugurate a joint conference of Chief Justices of High Courts and Chief Ministers of States which is being held here in New Delhi and being brought to you live on Doordarshan. Also present on the occasion will be the Chief Justice of Supreme Court Sri T.S. Thakur and Union Law and Justice Minister Sri D.V. Satanand Gowda. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a conference that is held from time to time and we see the arrival of the Honorable Prime Minister here in the plenary hall of Vigyan Bhavan. As he steps down to greet various chief justices, various judges from all across the country. A number of positive steps have been taken in the recent past to meet the various challenges that are faced by the judiciary in India. There has been an increase in investment in infrastructure that has resulted in India having more court halls in aggregate than functional courts. E-courts has been a mission project that has enabled litigants and lawyers to access their case data and cause lists online and facilitated monitoring of courts and cases by the judiciary. The idea behind this conference is really for the chief justices of the various states and the chief ministers to sit and discuss the various issues that are faced by the judiciary and to work towards speedy justice for all. A moment of lightness here as the Honorable Prime Minister of India greets the various chief ministers from across the country. We see Sri Sisodia, the Deputy CM of Delhi, Chief Minister of Gujarat, Chief Minister of Haryana, Sri Manohar Lal Khattar, Mehbooba Mufti, the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir, and various other chief ministers who are present here to attend this conference. And we now hand you over to the days. Good morning, excellencies, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ministry of Law and Justice, Government of India, I'd like to welcome you all to the inaugural session of the Joint Conference of Chief Ministers and Chief Justices of High Courts. This Joint Conference of the Executive and Judiciary is held every year to discuss various steps required to surmount challenges facing the judicial system. A number of positive steps have been taken in the recent past to meet these challenges, including simplifying court procedures, strengthening legal aid, reviewing the quality of legal education, and operationalizing commercial courts, just to name a few. This conference will further deliberate on the future course of action required to ensure speedy, affordable, and equitable access to justice for all. We are very honoured on this occasion with the presence of the Honourable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, and I request Madam Kusumjit Sidhu, Secretary Justice, to welcome him with a bouquet of flowers. I 
I request Secretary Justice to welcome Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Shri T. S. Thakur, with a bouquet. I request Madam Sindhu to welcome the Honorable Minister for Law and Justice, Shri Sadanand Gaudaji. And now, a formal welcome address by Shri Sadanand Gauda, Honorable Minister for Law and Justice. Honorable Prime Minister of India, Shri Narendra Modi ji, Honorable Chief Justice of India, Justice T.S. Thakurs, Honorable Distinguished Judges of Supreme Court, Chief Ministers, Chief Justice of various High Courts, other dignitaries who are gathered here, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> it is a pleasure and privilege for me to welcome Honorable Prime Minister to this joint conference of Chief Ministers and Chief Justices I wholeheartedly welcome Honorable Prime Minister to this August conference, which certainly will give a clear direction to give more access to justice to the people of this country. I welcome Honorable Prime Minister, sir. I also extend my warm welcome to Honorable Chief Justice, Justice T.S. Takurji, for a for this joint conference. I extend my warm welcome to the distinguished judges of the Supreme Court, chief ministers, chief justices, and other dignitaries who have gathered here, who have joined us today uh, to deliberate upon the pressing issues facing the justice delivery system in the country. The fact that this conference is being held within a span of one year after the last conference reflects the commitment of the government and the judiciary to move ahead at a faster pace towards providing timely, affordable, and quality justice to the citizens of this great nation. The high courts and the state governments have a major role to play the development of judicial administration in the states. Recognizing this fact, a landmark resolution was adopted in the last conference when it was decided that the Chief Justice of the High Courts and the Chief Ministers of the States would institute a mechanism for regular interaction amongst the themselves to resolve the issues relating to the infrastructure and manpower needs and facilities for the judiciary. I am sure that in most of the states, such a mechanism has already been instituted and this conference would provide us the perfect opportunity to deliberate upon ways and means to take this initiative forward. As for the information available with us, the central government and the state governments have together spent on an average a sum of about 2,000 crore per annum during the last three years on development of, development of judicial infrastructure. I am glad to inform this August gathering that overall availability of the court halls now matches the working strength of around 16,000 judges, judicial officers in the subordinate judiciary. With the number of projects in hand, we are aiming at 20,000 court halls in the near future to match the availability of the sanctioned strength in every state. While notable progress has been made on judicial infrastructure front, the same cannot be said about the availability of judicial manpower. Despite considerable increase in the sanctioned strength of the high courts and district courts in the recent past. The persistence of large number of vacancies of judges and judicial officers is an area of concern. I would urge the High Court to adopt a proactive approach in selection of the suitable candidates for various judicial positions. As all of you are aware, the protracted nature of litigation in the country has an adverse impact in the investor sentiments. In order to assuage these concerns, and as part of government's continuous efforts to forge investor-friendly environment in the country, the government has initiated a number of steps, including setting up of commercial courts and amendments to Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996 and Negotiable Venetian Act 1881. 
These initiatives are intrinsically linked to the speeding up of the dispute resolution process, both within the formal court system as well as under alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Concerns regarding the inordinate delays in conclusion of the criminal trials have been expressed by various parliamentary committees. The government has over the years established expert committees to review the criminal justice system in order to make it more responsive to the needs of the society. Some of the recommendations of these committees have been implemented and legislative provisions incorporated in the procedural laws. However, legislative reforms alone are not sufficient reforms in policing and investigative mechanisms are as important as reforms in court processes. Law Commission of India is now reviewing both substantive and procedural aspects of our criminal justice system. I have requested the Chairman Law Commission to expedite their recommendations in this regard. As per the data complied by the National Crime Bureau, Records Bureau, at the end of 2014, there were about 2.82 lakh under trial prisoners in jails, which constituted two-thirds of the total inmates. I understand during the early years after our independence, the under trial prisoners constituted only one-third of the total uh, prisoners in jails. This situation prevails despite amendments in the Criminal Procedure Code prescribed for release of under trial prisoners on personal bond who have spent half of their maximum sentence. I would urge the state government and chief justice of the high courts to take appropriate steps to ensure that this provision is implemented expeditiously. The e-court integrated mission mode project was launched with the objective of improving access to justice with the help of technology. Phase one of the e-court project witnessed significant results, which include ICT infrastructure, upgradation of subordinate courts, launch of national e court portal and constitution of process re-engineering committees by the high courts. Phase two, currently in progress, aims at setting up the, of centralized filing centers, digitization of documents, adoption of documental management systems, creation of e-filing and e-payment gateways. However, there is a lack of awareness about the potential of e court project among the judges as well as the public at large. I would urge upon the chief ministers of the high courts uh, to not only sensitize the members of the judiciary to utilize full potential of technological advancements being made, but at the same time disseminate necessary information about litigant-friendly services being provided under the project uh, to public at large. At present, the national judicial data grid provides summary of pending and disposal cases in the district and subordinate courts level. However, in addition, periodic repairs, uh, reports on e-courts in a format that allows for assessment of judicial productivity and congestion rates must also be pub published. Categorization and assignment of cases through case management system will help to ensure that all old matters are disposed on the priority basis. Grouping of cases need to be undertaken as ongoing continuous exercise so that cases arising out of the same subject matter and involving same question of law can be assigned to one judge. Although several important and innovative initiatives are placed to improve upon the existing court processes, at, there is a significant room for further work in this regard. The high courts must take a strong leadership role in actively promoting a shift towards higher efficiency in the implementation of the project. Further research in the area of process simplification should also be encouraged to assess if the litigants are benefiting from the various initiatives and to assess what else could be done. ICT initiatives, if successfully completed, will ease the day-to-day -day -day management of court processes and provide necessary uh, tools to higher judiciary for performance appraisal of subordinate courts. The bar in India plays an important role in our judicial process. Including alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, we must continuously engage with the bar for improving their standards and practices as also for upgrading their professional skills through the continued legal education. The Bar Council has also expressed keen interest in taking higher responsibilities under legal aid programs keeping in mind 
the critical importance of cooperation of the bar, I would urge upon the state government and the high courts to actively engage the enlisting their support for various programs and initiatives which reduction in pendency of the courts. <clears throat> uh, we have a comprehensive agenda for judicial remof, uh, reforms placed before us today with which encompasses a broad range of topics, all of which have a crucial bearing on timely delivery of justice, a goal that the government and judiciary are jointly working to accomplish. I look forward to constructive discussions in this regard. I would like to conclude once again, extending my warm wel welcome to all of you. Uh, uh, I would like to inform this August House, Honorable Prime Minister has to rush to Jharkhand for an emergent meeting there in Jharkhand. Jharkhand. So his presence today was really required for us. So he has made it a point in spite of his busy schedule, he was able to come over here and he was, uh, he is with us in this uh, present gathering. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. I'd now like to request Shri T.S. Thakur, Honorable the Chief Justice of India, to please address the gathering. Honorable the Prime Minister, Honorable Minister for Law and Justice, Ms. Sidhu, Secretary, Government of India, Department of Justice, Honorable Chief Ministers from different states, Chief Justices from different High Courts, my esteemed colleagues from the Supreme Court, senior judicial officers, government officers, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Prime Minister, since 1953, Chief Justices from courts, small and big, have assembled annually in Delhi under the auspices of the Supreme Court of India, not because they are administratively under the control of the Supreme Court, not because they are worried about their independence or independence of judiciary, not because they want their working conditions or service conditions to be improved or altered. Not because they need can seek any post-retirement post benefits from the government. But because they know they realize that they are a part of a judicial system that serves the largest democracy in the world. Because they realize that they are the guardians of the Constitution and that they must uphold and enforce the rule of law. They realize that administration of justice in this country, which constitutes one-fifth of the human race on this planet, is a formidable challenge. Because they realize that uh, access to justice continues in this country to be an illusion, with at least 30 percent of our population below the poverty line. And because they realize that it is necessary for them and for everyone in the high courts and the subordinate judiciary to do 
whatever is necessary to maintain the credibility of the institution and to make access to justice a reality. This conference which we concluded yesterday is also in the same spirit. Several issues were discussed, issues that are often mentioned by people within the system, from outside the system, people in the executive, people in the legislature, both those who admire the system and the institution and those who are critical about it. Several resolutions have been passed. We discussed and resolved that infrastructure and subordinate courts requires to be upgraded. We discussed and resolved that the cadre strength of judges in the subordinate courts needs to be reviewed and revised. We discussed and resolved that vacancies in the high courts ought to be filled up immediately. We discussed and resolved that we need to perhaps restart morning evening courts with the help of retired judicial officers. We discussed and resolved that under trial prisoners who account for 63% of the total population in jails, their cases need to be taken up, especially those who have been in jail and who are facing trials for the past 10 years. We discussed and resolved that the implementation of information and communication technology needs to be given a push. We discussed and resolved that we must do whatever is possible to reduce the areas so that there are no cases more than five years old in the subordinate courts and the high courts. We resolved to constitute a National Judicial Council for using judicial academies which have come up throughout the country now more effectively for training of judicial officers. We discussed and resolved strengthening of legal aid programs should be more effectively carried out, fast-tracking of cases of crime against women, children and differently able and marginalized sections of the society should be taken up. We also resolved that strengthening of judicial system dealing with juveniles is important and ought to be taken up. And we discussed ways and means by which we can utilize the grants which the 14th Finance Commission has sanctioned for judiciary in this country. I do not want to go into the details of all these issues and the resolutions that we passed. But I want to point out to all of you that the challenge of administration of justice has become bigger and bigger and is just assuming greater and greater proportions and dimensions. I may indicate by reference to the Supreme Court because that is also an index of finding out how challenges have multiplied manifold over the years. Honorable President, Honorable Prime Minister, you will know perhaps you are not directly connected with legal profession. I know you are not a lawyer, but uh, as the Prime Minister of this country, you would have known that we started the Supreme Court in 1950 with one plus seven judges, eight judges in the Supreme Court. 
and there were at that time just about 1,215 cases. So it was just about 100 cases per judge when we started our journey. Within one decade, in 1960, we rose the sanctioned strength of the Supreme Court to 1 plus 13, Chief Justice and 13 judges, 14 in all. And the cases rose to 3,247. In 1977, the strength was raised to 1 plus 17, 18 judges in all. And the cases rose to 14,501. In 1986, there was another increase in the Supreme Court judges' strength. It became 1 plus 25, 26 judges. The cases rose to 27,881. By 2009, The strength rose to 1 plus 30, which is the current strength, 31 in all, and the cases rose to 77,151. By 2014, with a strength of 31 judges, we had a backlog of 81,583 cases, which was reduced to the current pendency of 60,260 cases. The institution has increased, and this you will realize when we say that during the past four months, from December 3rd when I took over, till now, 17,482 cases have been filed in the Supreme Court. If you compare them with the filing and the pendency in 1950, when it was 1,215 cases in all, the filing in four months has gone to 17,482. And we have disposed of, during this period, 16,474 cases. Out of 17,482, 16,474 have been disposed of. This gives an indication of the kind of growth in terms of litigation multiplying in courts. If at the apex level you can have this kind of a phenomenal growth in the litigation, you can understand, you can appreciate what would be the kind of growth at the trial court, the first appellate stage and the second appellate stage. There's no wonder, therefore, that in the high courts today, there are 38 lakh 68,000 cases pending, as in April 2016. 38 lakhs is a very, very huge number. And the position is complicated, it becomes worse when you feel, when you see there are 434 vacancies that need to be filled up. Now, what is the way forward is the question. I remember when I was in fifth standard or sixth standard, there used to be a paper of arithmetics. Wo puchte the sawal ke agar ek sadak paanch aadmi das din mein banate hain to wohi sadak agar ek din mein banani ho to kitne aadmi chahiye? And the answer used to be pachas. Atatis lakh Atasat has a kiss. Connectanic, a little kidney admitting. 
कितने जज चाहिए ये बात हम क्यों नहीं समझते नाइनटीन एटी सेवन द लॉ कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया जस्ट रीड द रिपोर्ट दिस क्वेश्चन कैन ऑफ कोर्स बी अप्रोच फ्रॉम सेवरल परस्पेक्टिव फर्स्ट वी मे ट्राई टू कोरिलेट द जनरल इंक्रीज इन पॉपुलेशन rate with the question of number of judges in all cadres in regard to political representation in parliament the demographic factor has been frozen to the levels of population as in 1971 india has today only 10 judges per million population australia which had roughly 10 million population in 1975 had 577 judges giving an average of 41 judges per million canada with her 1812 judges with a population of roughly 25 million as of 1973 had the rate of 75 judges per million england with 2504 judges for roughly 50 million people in 1973 had the rate of 50 judges per million and the united states with three times less population than india had 25087 judges as at 1981 giving an average of 107 judges per million of population this information filed by the union of india expert professor mar galanter has been endorsed by the union of india clearly the total judge strength of 7675 is grossly inadequate in india and the commission recommends taking either as a major it can safely be estimated on the conservative side that you would need a minimum increase in the judge strength from present 7675 to 40357 increasing the ratio of judges per million of population from 10 to 50 in 1987 the law commission which is the government of india law commission not a private body recommends 40000 judges in the country then comes of course in action on the part of the governments the increase does not take place so the supreme court and judicial side takes up this issue in all india judges association case in 2002 15 years later the court says mr f s nariman has drawn our attention to yet another important aspect with regard to dispensation of justice namely the huge backlog of undecided cases one of the reasons which has been indicated even in the 120th law commission report which i just now read was the inadequate strength of judges compared to the population of the country even the standing committee of the parliament headed by shri pranab mukherjee in its 85th report submitted in february 2002 to the parliament has recommended that there should be an increase in the number of judges the said committee has noted the judge population ratio in different countries and has adversely commented on the judge population ratio of 10 judges per million of people in india the report recommends the acceptance in the first instance of increasing the judges strength to 50 judges per 10 lakh people as recommended by the 120th law commission report and the court said we are of the opinion that time has now come for protecting one of the pillars of the constitution namely the judicial system by directing increase in the first instance in the judge strength ratio from existing 10.5 or 13 per 10 lakh people to 50 judges 
per 10 lakh people. And the court directed that you increase the judge strength to 50, which would mean around 40,000 judges in the country. But nothing moves. The Chief Justice of India, Justice Altmas Kabir, writes a letter on 21st February 2013 to the Prime Minister of India, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, makes a mention about <coughs> the reports and the recommendations and the orders passed by the Supreme Court and says that we need to increase the number of judges. And the conclusion is, in the case of All India Judges Association, the Supreme Court has inter alia observed that increase in judge strength to 50 judges per 10 lakh people should be effected and implemented with the filling up of posts in a phased manner to be determined and directed by the Union Ministry of Law. It was directed that process should be completed and the enhanced number of vacancies and posts should be filled up within a period of five years from the date of judgment, that is March 21st, 2002. As of date, the judge population ratio is hardly 15 per 10 lakh people in the country. So over a period of five years, raise it to 50 judges per million was the letter. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh replies. He says, Dear Chief Justice, I fully agree with you on the need for a large increase in the number of courts in our country. to deal with the huge pendency of cases that we face. Our government supports the proposal for doubling the existing number of courts and providing the necessary infrastructure and staff for this purpose. However, the initiative for establishing new courts must come from the state governments. As far as central government is concerned, we do have a scheme for providing financial assistance to states as on 20, on 25-25 on funding pattern, 90% to 10% for northeastern states for development of infrastructure for subordinate judiciary. We would be willing to provide for an increased quantum of funds for this scheme to the extent we can. I am thankful to you, to the judiciary, for the steps it has taken to fast track trial of offenses relating to women, etc. 2013, the Government of India commits itself to an increase in the judge strength. 1987, the requirement was 40,000 judges. From 1987 till now, you have added 25 crore in terms of population. You have grown into one of the fastest growing economies in the world. We are inviting foreign direct investment into this country. We want people to come and make in India. We want people to come and invest in India. But those whom we are inviting also are concerned about the ability of the judicial system in this country to deal with the cases and the disputes that may arise out of such investments. efficacy of the judicial system is so vitally connected with the development of this country. And therefore, it is not only in the name of uh, the litigant, the poor litigant, people who are languishing in jails, but also in the name of development of this country, its progress, that I beseech you <laughs> to rise to the occasion and realize that it is not enough to criticize. You cannot 
shift the entire burden to the judiciary. If you compare the performance of Indian judges with those in other countries, where heads and shoulders above them. American Supreme Court decides 81 cases per year, the entire Supreme Court. Nine of them sit to dispose of just about 81 cases. Average disposal of an Indian judge is 2,600 cases, whether it is a munsif or a Supreme Court judge. When judges come from abroad, and watch us working, they are amazed. They can't understand how can judges work under such stressful conditions. And yet, People have faith because we are doing our best. Speeches have been made in the past. People have spoken from this audience, this dais, in conferences, in seminars, debates in the parliament, and all. But I think nothing really appears to be moving. The central government says, yes, we commit ourselves, but it is the state government's responsibility. The state government say, no, give, let the central government provide funds to us, assistance to us. And while this tug of war goes on, the judge strength remains where it is. 38 lakh cases remain where they are. Three crore cases in the subordinate courts continue to wait. What perhaps people don't know and what is never accurately and effectively projected is that in the lower courts, we find we, we get around two crore cases every year. And we dispose of two crore cases. Nobody talks about the disposals. The Indian judiciary processes about five crore cases every year, out of which two crore cases are disposed of. But there is a limit. There is a limit to a judge's performance, that is, capacity to perform. What cannot be done by 2,000 or 20,000 judges in five years, if you want us to dispose of the total number of cases in two years, it is impossible. The only remedy is to add to the number of courts, to sanction courts, to raise the judge population ratio, to at least 50 judges per million, as was recommended way back in 1987, and as has been accepted over the years by the governments, successive governments. Four hundred and thirty-four vacancies in the high courts. They are touched four hundred and seventy, thanks to the Judicial Appointments Commission the controversy that landed in the court, the time it took to get disposed of, the vacancies kept on accumulating. Over, over a period of six weeks or so, we have cleared all the proposals that were sent to us. So far as we are concerned, there is absolutely no pendency with us. The Collegium has cleared within six weeks. I have written to the Chief Justices 
that they should immediately take up the process of making proposals. I have as advanced copies of the proposals received 170 proposals. 53 have already been appointed out of the earlier proposals. 53 judges, some additional judges have been made permanent. So over a period of three months or so, 140 or 145 people have either been appointed permanent or additional judges. But 170 judges, 169 proposals to be precise, are still pending with the government. How much time does it require to process a proposal? When we have an avalanche of cases, when people are languishing in jails for over 10 years. In Allahabad, there are 10 lakh cases. Jails are full. They are overflowing. There may be a stage when it may be difficult to find a suitable candidate for appointment against these vacancies because the number of vacancies are so large and suitable candidates so less. 50% of the proposals that were sent to us were turned down because we have raised the bar. The slightest blemish against a candidate has resulted in his rejection. We don't want any criticism about how people get appointed. Much has been said about it. And still, these vacancies await being filled up. In this resolution that we passed over the past two years in Chief Justice's conference, we have resolved that apart from fresh appointments that we are making, and that may take another two months or so, we need to use the services of judges who have already proved themselves in the system. Article 224 of the Constitution provides for such contingencies. Judges who have served for 20 years, 30 years, risen from the ranks, judges who have been accepted because of their integrity and reputation, Judges who have done well, to ask them to go home, not to utilize them or their services, at this stage when we have reached a critical stage, will be criminal. We have recommended, and we want this to be considered in the Chief Justices and Chief Ministers Joint Conference, whether this extraordinary situation that we are faced with, with so many vacancies, we need to exercise that power under 224 and appoint people out of judges who have served, who have worked, and who are ready to work for another two years or so. I would also request all of the all the chief ministers here, to please uh, consider revision of the cadre strengths, as has been recommended, because uh, that is the only way forward. I have no manner of doubt that if that is done, we should be able to dispose of all such cases that are more than five years old in the system today. The National Court Management Systems Committee has recommended in a mission mode you dispose of cases so that there is no case pending more than five years old in the system. But there are thousands of cases, in, indeed lakhs of cases, which are more than five years old. The existing strength of judges is, is in, inadequate for achieving that objective. And therefore, unless the number of judges is increased, we will always be lagging behind. Honorable Prime Minister, commercial courts is one of your very laudable and very, very uh, important uh, agendas. 
the commercial courts concept came up because we wanted that the image of Indian judiciary in the eyes of people from other countries should improve. Commercial courts should quickly dispose of cases, commercial disputes. But what is happening is that commercial courts are being designated from out of the existing judge strength and in the existing infrastructure. That was never the object. If in Tisazari you simply put a board, this is a commercial court, it doesn't satisfy the objective behind setting up of such courts. You need to provide a totally different environment for a commercial court. Today, a corporate litigant is required to stand, jostle, rub shoulders with maybe a pickpocket, a, a, a driver, or some other small time thief or petty offender in the ordinary courts. Commercial court concept was that we will provide the kind of environment which a corporate client may feel comfortable in. He can go to the commercial court, he can pay for that facility, but he should feel comfortable. He should feel comfortable in terms of the place that he sits, where he sits, in terms of the facility that he gets, because you are trying to promote the image of the legal system in India. I don't think if we simply go on setting up commercial courts without providing the necessary infrastructure and the environment it requires, commercial courts will ever serve the purpose for which you have conceived them. I was in Dubai some time back. I was taken to the commercial court complex. I was amazed at the kind of environment they provide. The environment itself is different. One feels, well, this is an, it, it is like an operation theater where you have a solemn and very, very efficient system. I would humbly suggest that while we stand by the concept of commercial courts, which will be model courts, in fact, they can be model courts. Slowly, once you have established commercial courts, model courts can also be telescoped into them. In fact, a commercial court should become a model court in terms of the environment, in terms of the workload before, before the judge, in terms of the time that the judge will take to dispose of the matter, in terms of the procedures that are relevant to a commercial court process. And that is how I think the image of the Indian judiciary which you have at heart will get enhanced. Simply putting the old wine in the new bottle will not make any difference. So while we strongly support your concept, we would request you also to please simultaneously think in terms of providing additional infrastructure for commercial courts, additional judges for commercial courts, additional staff for commercial courts. Otherwise, what will happen? Corporate litigant will get a preferential treatment. His cases may get on the fast track, but other litigants who have other disputes will continue to languish. I think we need to look into this afresh and whatever is required for course correction needs to be done. I am extremely grateful to the law minister for giving me this opportunity to share my views. I somehow feel that if nothing else has worked till now in terms of improving the conditions of the judiciary, an emotional appeal may work. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you, Your Lordship. I now request the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji, to please address the gathering.
मुख्य न्यायाधीश आदरणीय जस्टिस टी एस ठाकुर जी मंत्रिमंडल के मेरे साथी श्रीमान सदानंद गौर जी सुश्री कुशमित जी सभी उपस्थित आदरणीय मुख्यमंत्री गण सभी आदरणीय जजीज प्रतिवर्ष इस प्रकार की एक हमारी मीटिंग होती है इस बार काफ़ी विस्तृत एजेंडाज के मुद्दे हैं मुझे बताया गया है कि दो दिन जजीज बड़े विस्तार से चर्चा की है काफ़ी अच्छे सुझाव भी आए हैं और मुझे ये भी बताया गया कि बड़े कमिटमेंट के साथ चीज़ों को आगे बढ़ाने का हर तरफ से प्रयास हुआ है मैं इसके लिए आदरणीय ठाकुर साहब और उनकी पूरी टीम को हृदय से बहुत बहुत बधाई देता हूं ताकि इन चीज़ों को आगे बढ़ाने के लिए सार्थक प्रयास हो रहे हैं पिछले दिनों भोपाल में एक रिट्रीट का कार्यक्रम हुआ जिसकी कल मैं ठाकुर साहब से सुन रहा था मुझे बड़ी प्रसन्नता हुई कि लॉ पॉइंट के बाहर भी बहुत बड़ा देश होता है तो उसको भी जानना समझना और राष्ट्रीय अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर क्या क्या चल रहा है क्या चुनौतियां हैं क्या संभावनाएं हैं और देश के गणमान्य एक्सपर्ट्स को बुलाया था और सभी जजीज उनको सुन रहे थे क्वेश्चन आंसर कर रहे थे मैं समझता हूँ ये परंपरा अपने आप में एक बहुत ही उत्तम परंपरा है हो सकता है शायद राज्यों में भी आगे चल कर के इस प्रकार का प्रयास हो तो शायद जो ठाकुर साहब ने बीच में हो रहा था कहते हैं कि लेकिन कई वर्षों तक तो बंद रहा था मैं समझता हूँ ये काफ़ी उपकारक होगा इस प्रकार की चीज़ें जुड़ने से कई विषयों की यहाँ पर चर्चा होने वाली है इसलिए उसकी बहुत गहरे में मैं जाता नहीं हूँ लेकिन ये बात सही है कि भारत के सामान्य नागरिक को आज भी न्याय व्यवस्था पर पूरा भरोसा है भरोसा क्या एक आस्था है श्रद्धा है और ये हमारे देश की बहुत बड़ी पूंजी है हम सबका दायित्व बनता है कि इस आस्था को हम बरकरार रखें उसको हम बनाए रखें ताकि कभी भी सामान्य मानवीय के जीवन में ऐसी स्थिति ना आए कब कहाँ जाऊँ एक जगह है जहाँ उसको विश्वास है कि मैं जा सकता हूँ और वो स्थिति बनाने में सरकार की भी बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेवारी है और मुझे विश्वास है कि सरकार अपनी जिम्मेवारियों को निभाने में कभी भी कोताही नहीं बरतेगी ठाकुर साहब ने सही कहा कि मैं इस लॉ की दुनिया का व्यक्ति नहीं रहा हूँ नहीं मेरा ऐसा बैकग्राउंड रहा है तो सुप्रीम कोर्ट का जन्म कब हुआ क्या हुआ वो सारा विस्तार से मुझे आज उस ज्ञान का भी लाभ मिला और उनकी पीड़ा भी मैं समझ सकता हूँ कि अगर 87 में जो बातें हुई आज 2016 में भी वो 87 से अब तक जरूर कुछ कारण रहे होंगे या जरूर कुछ मजबूरियाँ रही होगी मैं तो कभी उसकी डिटेल में गया नहीं हूँ कि 87 में क्या हुआ था कैसे हुआ था लेकिन जब जगे तब सुबह आगे हम कुछ अच्छा करें पीछे का जो भी बोझ है उस बोझ को कम करते हुए हम आगे कैसे बढ़े कई कारण होंगे और एक प्रमुख कारण का वर्णन भी ठाकुर साहब ने किया कि स्ट्रेंथ अपने आप में एक बहुत बड़ा कारण है लेकिन कुछ समाज जीवन में भी बदलाव आते हैं इस बदलाव अब हम हम लोगों को मालूम है कि एक जमाना था जब गांव के मैं एक बैदराज होता था और पूरा गांव स्वस्थ रहता था अब आज आँख का डॉक्टर हो गया कान का डॉक्टर अलग हो गया पैर का अलग हो गया हार्ट का अलग हो गया लेकिन बीमारी बढ़ती गई <laughs> तो ये समस्या समाज जीवन में कई प्रकार की आती होगी कैसी होगी ये हम सबको चिंतन का विषय है कि क्या कारण है इसका ये सरकार में भी मेरा ये मत है कि कानून बनाते समय 
जितनी चौकसी बरतनी चाहिए उतनी हमारे यहाँ उसमें कमी महसूस होती है ड्राफ्टिंग से लेकर के डिबेट से लेकर के कानून बनने तक और वो एक सबसे बड़ा कारण बना है कि कोर्ट में इंटरप्रिटेशन को लेकर के बहुत बड़ी मात्रा में चीजें जाती है अदरवाइज कानून जितना स्पष्ट हो कि कोई भी व्यक्ति निर्णय करे तो दुविधा कम रहे धीरे धीरे उस एफिशिएंसी की ओर जाना पड़ेगा दूसरा एक है कि हमारे यहाँ कानूनों का ढेर बहुत है मैंने आते ही एक काम शुरू किया है कि इन कानूनों के बोझ से कैसे मुक्ति दिलाई जाए सामान्य मानवी को कानूनों की संख्या कैसे कम की जाए एक कमेटी बिठाई थी करीब पंद्रह सौ ऐसे कानून ध्यान में आए हैं कि जो कभी अठारह साल के थे कभी 1850 के 80 के 90 के ऐसे ऐसे कानून मैंने अब वो कोई इरेलीवेंट हो चुके हैं तो ऐसा वरना क्या होता है जिसको कोई काम रोकना है तो 200 साल पुराने कानून दिखा देता है कि देखिए ऐसा कानून था इसलिए तुम्हारा ये नहीं होगा तो फिर वो कोर्ट में जाता है तो ऐसी चीज़ें व्यवस्थाओं में काफ़ी अड़चणें कर रही हैं सफाई चल रही है धीरे धीरे मैं समझता हूँ जितना समय मुझे मिला है उस समय का भरपूर प्रयास हम करेंगे प्रक्रियाएं तेज गति से हो जल्दी हो और आवश्यकताओं की पूर्ति के लिए प्रयास हो ये सब ने सबका काम है हम करते रहेंगे करना चाहिए भी और मैं तो चाहूँगा अगर ठाकुर साहब को सुविधा हो और शायद कोई संवैधानिक सीमाएं न कठिनाइयाँ पैदा करती हो तो कभी एक आध सरकार में से दो चार प्रमुख लोग और आपकी टीम के भी सभी लोग बैठ कर के कमरे में इन समस्याओं के समाधान के कंधे से कंधा मिला करके कैसे रास्ते निकाले जाए तो हो सकता है कि कुछ क्योंकि आपने जो बातें बताई वो बड़ी महत्वपूर्ण है और उन महत्वपूर्ण बातों का रास्ता भी तो खोजना होगा सिर्फ मैं सुन कर के चला जाऊंगा ये ऐसा मैं इंसान नहीं हूँ मैं उसको सीरियसली लेकर के कुछ रास्ते खोजने के प्रयास करूँगा सफलता सफलता तो अलग बात है लेकिन कोशिश करनी चाहिए मैं कोशिश करना चाहूँगा और मुझे विश्वास कि आप जैसे अनुभवी लोगों का साथ मिला तो मैं मैं तो इस फील्ड का हूँ नहीं है ये मेरा लाभ भी है और मेरा नुकसान भी है <laughs> तो मुझे अगर आप लोगों की मदद मिलेगी तो हम जरूर इसका रास्ता निकालेंगे मुझे याद है मैं पंद्रह साल तक इस मीटिंग में आया हूँ और हमेशा सामने बैठता था और बाद में जब ऊपर बैठते थे तो कैमरा वगैरह रहते नहीं थे तो ज़रा खुल करके बात भी करता था मैं और मैंने एक बार कह दिया था साहब कोर्ट का समय बढ़ाएं तो कैसा रहे वैकेशन कम करें तो कैसा रहे और पता नहीं मेरे ऊपर ऐसी आफत आ गई थी <laughs> उसके बाद लंच था तो लंच में कई जजिज ने मुझे पकड़ा <laughs> क्या समझते तो हो अपने आप को <laughs> तो मैं तो उसी दिन से डर गया था जी <laughs> लेकिन फिर भी मैं मानता हूं कि जिसके पास जो जिम्मेवारी है सब लोग ईमानदारी से निष्ठा से देश के गरीब आदमी की भलाई के लिए काम कर रहे हैं ये विश्वास हम सबको होना चाहिए और मुझे पूरा भरोसा है कि हमारे देश की जुड़ी से भी उस दिशा में सक्रिय है सजग है मुझे पूरा भरोसा है और हम सबको भरोसा रहेगा तो देश की समस्याओं का समाधान भी होगा और हम मिल बैठ करके समाधान निकालेंगे भी मेरा विश्वास है मैं फिर एक बार सभी आदरणीय मुख्यमंत्रियों ने इन सारी बातों को सुना है वे भी उतनी ही जिम्मेवारी के साथ अपनी सरकारें चलाते हैं क्योंकि उनको भी जनता जनार को जवाब देना होता है और हर पांच साल में एक बार देना पड़ता है और अब तक तो बार बार चुनाव आते हैं इसलिए किसी न किसी रूप में साल पांच साल में तीन तीन बार तो जाना ही पड़ता है क्योंकि इस दिनों ये चर्चा चल रही है सभी दल मुझे कह रहे हैं कि साहब ये चुनाव लोकसभा और विधानसभा के साथ साथ कैसे हो हर प्रकार से क्योंकि काफी समय उसमें जा रहा है कई चीज़ें निर्णय में 40 40 50 50 दिन इसलिए रुक जाती हैं क्योंकि कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट लग जाता है और देश में कोई ना कोई जगह होती है जहाँ कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट होता है तो इन दिनों मुझे विपक्ष के सर भी लीडर्स मिले थे वो भी कह रहे थे कि साहब कुछ रास्ता निकालिए कि ये असेंबली के और पार्लियामेंट के चुनाव साथ साथ हो ताकि बाकी कुछ काम हो तो है कुछ कठिनाइयाँ उन सारे चीज़ों का रास्ता निकालना होगा मिल बैठ करके निकालना होगा मुझे मैं क्षमा मांगूंगा क्योंकि मुझे आज यहाँ से झारखंड जाने के लिए निकलना है लेकिन